That was such a great musical intro. Hi everyone, my name is Allison Birch, and I'm currently a resident at the IBM Art and Technology Center in New York City, and I just got my master's degree from New York University's Interactive Telecommunications Program, which is where I began some of this research. So, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk today about some broader philosophical issues and what it means to make liberation technology in a gleaner's economy. And then briefly, I'll mention a couple products or projects that I made. So gleaning is actually a dated biblical term. It's the act of collecting leftover crops from farmers' fields after they have been commercially harvested or on fields where it is not economically profitable to harvest. And what I want to propose is that this is actually where the majority of the world's people are located when it comes to technology. And so people throw around this term, oops, make the world a better place. And often I actually think this is in perhaps destroying some of the structures that we've made that are exploiting people rather than continuing to create more and more stuff. It's actually about making stuff for the gleaners. So the question I have is how do you make stuff in a world that's messed up? How do you make stuff when we don't need more stuff? And how as technologists do we frame the questions that we ask ourselves about what we make? So I came up with this redefinition of what liberation technology means as part of my master's thesis. And how I define it is technology that exists to liberate people from unjust economic, political, or social conditions. So what do these social, economic, and political injustices look like? And how has the tech scene um, actually exacerbated these issues? So we've all heard this utopian vision that the internet will change everything. All we need is um, more openness. The beauty of the internet and connected devices is that is this idea of self-stabilizing, inclusive, democratic, peer-to-peer, distributed networks where we're all free to pursue our own happiness. Decentralization. Democratic. Because if only we were able to have more decentralization, more self-government, somehow the world will just magically be a better place. So what actually happened? In fact, the decentralization of the internet has coincided with the great centralization of power and wealth. In 2010, 93% of the additional income created in the United States went to the top 1% of people. Oxfam estimates that the richest 85 people in the world own as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity. And so what I'd like to propose is that when we allow technology to act in our stead, it actually enables us to remain politically passive. We don't have to assume political responsibility because technology is projecting this fantasy of unity or wholeness. Which brings me to the political theorist Jody Dean, who um, lives in Geneva, New York, who writes about this idea of communicative capitalism. And what this means is that the basic unit of communication has shifted from the message to the contribution itself. So these exchanges, rather than being fundamental to democratic politics, are actually the basic elements of capitalist production. Jody Dean calls this the fantasy of participation, where doing is reduced to talking. Messages are contributions to circulating content, not actions to elicit responses, in which their exchange value overtakes their use value. And so she asks a great question. Why, in an age celebrated for its communications, has there been no response? So let's go back to liberation technology, and I'll uh, briefly mention a couple projects that I made in the past year. So I made something called the Dumb Store, and uh, Bruce Sterling has a great quote that I took completely out of context from this wonderful essay he just wrote called The Epic Struggle of the Internet of Things, which, has anyone read that? It's wonderful. I highly suggest that you read that. Uh, and so he says, there's no power group of consequence in the world today that renounces smartphones. No one who matters refuses what they offer, which I would actually agree with them. Um, people with dumb phones aren't really a power group of consequence in the literal meaning of that term. But I'd like to know what sort of gleaning 
is available in this scenario. So the Dumb Store is an open source mobile app platform for dumb phones, which means not a smartphone. Uh, Hardware is constantly changing and companies profit from this planned obsolescence, which disproportionately affects the poor. However, I don't believe that people need to constantly be buying things like the, uh, the other cell phone mentioned earlier in order to access information. So the dumb store is all SMS and it allows people to access information normally accessed through smartphones. And it's open source, so people all around the world have created different apps like Wikipedia, weather, um, different transportation things. Uh, it was developed in collaboration with Ramsey Nasser at IBM in 2013, and David Huerta, who's speaking later, is now working on it also with me. Okay, so back to communicative capitalism. So we're at a place where the problem is no longer getting people to express themselves, but providing any minuscule gap of solitude in which they might eventually find something to say. So this brings me to the physical world. How are we interacting in the present? And who cares if you have so much information if you can't deal with it? How can we change anything if we can't talk together, work together? So I made a log jammer, which is a cell phone jammer and a log. The log jammer provides a safe space in the woods, a right to be alone. What a relief to have the right to say nothing, because only then is there a chance of framing the things that might be worth saying. And here we have a cell phone tower that's actually a fake tree, but I took a real tree in real woods and put a jammer in it. And briefly, I'll go over this. This may look familiar. It's Eagle. Um, I found a schematic for GSM 1900 online, um, then went through dozens of design iterations, and milled, drilled, and soldered it on the Roland CNC. Uh, and um, yeah, you guys know how that works. Okay, so what is our common horizon? Within the next five years, a billion people will buy a smartphone for the first time. What will the result be of the sharing economy in which a Silicon Valley economy is created that's not actually sharing wealth between the rich and the poor, um, but it's constantly monetizing things that we normally give to each other for free. So where corporations see enormous potential for profit, um, what do we see? What happens when the political infrastructure is not in place to protect people from exploitative hardware and software? So these are some cheesy things. Um, so I want to just maybe say create some other options, create p things that allow people to opt out, create things that don't exploit people, um, and acknowledge our common struggle. And especially to Silicon Valley for them to make things that are financially inappropriate, i.e. not exploitative. So I want to thank, um, thanks for having me, and I especially want to thank Addie and Gabby for inviting me to speak. If you'd like to contact me, feel free to reach out on Twitter or on my website. So thank you.